Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Young, and today we're going to do Hope in the Last Days. This is the wedding feast. Coming right up. Okay, so when you think about the wedding feast, you're probably confused. You think, well, you know, when I think about my own wedding, I swear to you, I've been, I've done, as a singer, I've done so many weddings. I, I used to write a song for every single wedding. And I'll explain that a little bit more, but because it's a powerful part of my own personal story, but I would write a song for, for, the, for the couples. And it became a real heavy burden to me. And I struggled through that. And so I saw every type of wedding out there. And when I decided to have my own wedding with my wife, uh, it's a first wedding for both of us, we wanted to have it shorter. We didn't want to have people falling asleep with an hour, hour and a half long service kind of thing. I swear to you, ours was like 30, 35 minutes long, and that was with me singing a song and someone, <coughs> someone else singing a song or two. I can't remember what it was. I mean, it was like really fast. And people were like, wow, it's already over kind of thing. The, the wedding, when we think about the biblical type of wedding, you have to understand it starts with Esther. Esther has a very unique type of Old Testament viewpoint. That's the Jewish idea. The wedding actually is longer than you realize. So let's get into this and we'll, we'll start into our first, uh, uh, first point <coughs> there. So let's talk about the, the overall tradition that happens with the wedding feast. <coughs> Excuse me, the wedding. Now, what you, I want you to think about is you've got a, a gentleman or a guy who's, who's single and he wants to meet a woman, obviously. <clears throat> and we need a friend who knows the bride and the groom. So the, the friend actually introduces the groom to the bride because he knows both sides of this. And that's his big part of the job. Now, after that, we'll show you a little bit more about what he would do in that, that circumstance. Now, after they get introduced and they, they you know, look, at, look at each other, see what's happening, see if they're interested, it was a normally kind of short time frame before the groom would say, you know, this is the woman I want to marry. So what he would do is come to the father of the bride and say, hey, listen, I want to marry your daughter. Would you consent to that? So he asks the question first. Then there's this negotiation, and that negotiation is related to the father losing the, the bride or this, the daughter in his household. You see, in old time frames, it would be, you know, that father, let's say, is a carpenter or, <coughs> or a butcher or whatever that person might be. And that, um, that man, he's got a business to support in the community. And the, the daughters and the sons would all work for the dad and they would, they would support that, that, uh, that business model all the way through. So losing the daughter out of that family is a huge deal. It's like losing one of your best employees. And so that groom would have to compensate the dad for losing the daughter. And that's where we get this idea of the dowry, okay? Now, dowry is a little newer term, terminology than in you know, the Old Testament idea, but that's basically that idea. Now, here's the fascinating part from Jewish standpoint. Did you know that after that's negotiated, the bride, once she gets asked by the groom, would you marry me kind of thing, they could actually, she could say no, and the family could actually keep the, I mean, keep the dowry. Now, it's not a real good idea for the, the, uh, the father to keep the dowry and she gets, you know, she tries to, you know, get into that, that betrothal point with several other guys in the community. That would be a bad thing. 
but she is, they are legally obligated to keep that if they wanted to. Now, here's what she does. So she says, she's asked that next question and she says, yes, I will marry you. Now in the other, uh, here's the th interesting thing. Now in more modern tradition, the woman uses a, uh, a engagement ring. Right, so when I got one for my wife, we had two little rings and she's wearing the single band. And then the married band would kind of go together. You know, that's the, that's the point. And then I wore my ring. <coughs> now, so this is actually saying, hey, listen, I'm taken. This is what the woman would do. But that's not what ha would happen in that time frame. She would then get a lamp the lamp would have oil in it and she would light the lamp and she would keep it burning. And this is gonna be so powerful when you catch this. She would put it on the ledge and that ledge would, would show off and it's burning on the ledge and it would show off to the rest of the people of the community, hey, she's taken. So some young buck comes into town, looks at her and says, oh, she's pretty. But if he sees the lamp burning, he knows that she's taken. It's the same thing that happens when a woman, for instance, she's engaged and she's going to a conference in Atlanta and some guy starts hitting on her in a, you know, a, a gathering or whatever. And she's like, uh, she does some of this kind of idea. You know, she moves her glasses or kind of moves her hair, kind of looking, hey, leave me alone kind of thing. That's the idea because she's being faithful to her groom to come. Now, the groom's job is to go and build a house for his new bride. Now, in that point, they were married in, in the, the idea, but the ceremony hadn't taken place. Now, we call it engaged, but it's the same kind of basically the same idea, but a little stronger in the Jewish standpoint. Now he has to go to go build a house and his father would tell him when that was done. So you see how cool this is. And he, the father would come over, no, 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 you didn't build the, this over here right. You need to have a bigger spot here. Wait a second, that's ridiculous. You don't need that kind of thing. And the father would tell him. Now, He's building that <coughs> on his own, so he's already released a dowry and building a house. So this is a big deal, right? Now, once the father comes down and says, you know what, your house looks good, you're in order, go get your bride. So here's the cool part. So because there's not cell phones in that day and age, right? They just come into town they wouldn't just, just show up in town and they can't just say, hey, listen, I'm coming. What would happen is the friend who introduced the groom and the bride would show up in town and he would blow a trumpet. Boy, this is so cool when you see it. He would blow a trumpet and announce that the groom was coming. Her job is to take her lamp pull it down and walk down in front of the groom and say, I've been waiting for you, buddy, and I've been faithful. And, you, and some of you who kind of know where I'm going, you should feel a tingle in you because and I feel it right now because it's so exact with the, what the New Testament talks about. There's so many wedding ideas that happen. Now, of, of course, she has to make sure her wick is going, she's got oil in her lamp, the whole thing is, has to happen. Now, here's what they would do. They would go up and they would have a wedding. Now, you have to have the ceremony, it's the father, the family, <coughs> the friends, and they, I mean, the, the friends of those people, and they would have a, a private ceremony at first. Then there would be a seven day feasting that happens. And that seven day feast would go on that whole time frame. Now, after the seven day feast that they, they would feast with the community, and this is actually the wedding in Canaan. We'll talk more about that in that issue. And that's that feast that happens. Now, 
they would have that feast for the seven days and then they would ride off and go back to his house and now her house and they would live in that community for a year and, and the, he doesn't have to work. They were supposed to get to know one another and maybe start to have kids, whatever they were supposed to do, but they were getting to know one another. And you understand what I'm talking about when I say that. They were getting to know one another and they would live without working in that first year. That was the way that the tradition was. Now, let's move forward. <coughs> Why is the wedding feast so important? Okay. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Now I want you to think about this for a second. So now we're going to write a little bit on the board. So when we think about the Old Testament, oops, that's really a bad pen. It's not going to work anymore. Okay. Sorry, we'll race that up and we'll do this again. The Old Testament is talking mostly about the Jewish nation. Now they talk about other, other nations and other people with that, but it's not always in the greatest of lights. Then we have the New Testament. And I remember a guy when I was, I had fallen away from God. I, I was thinking about more about girls than I was thinking about God. And this is in my freshman year, I started to come back and I remember there's this guy named John Mark. John Mark was a cool guy. He was the Baptist Student Union uh, president or the campus pastor at the time. And he had a horrible knee. The guy could play basketball. He could shoot just gorgeous shots from the corner. And yet he just, he couldn't jump at all. And he kind of reminds me a little bit about some of my knee issues with that. So John Mark would, would teach a Bible study. And here's what he would say. And I've sort of told you this, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Whereas the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Now, a lots and lots of pastors get this. I mean, they've used this over and over again. I'm not the first one to say it. I'm not trying to be the last one that says this either. So you're gonna hear this over and over again, but this actually is really important to this part about the fulfillment of the bride. Okay. Every time you see conversations in the New Testament about the bride. Wow, this thing won't come off. Okay. Every time you see things about the bride, if you've been listening to the series, you know who the bride is. Who's the bride? That is the church. The other idea about the bride is we're also called the faithful. The bride is faithful, not because she's perfect. Okay. You're not faithful because you're perfect. You're faithful because he is perfect in you with the Holy Spirit inside of you. This word, and I've mentioned to you this before, be perfect as I am perfect. That bothered me for more than 30 years until I realized what it was really saying. What it was really saying is that you can't be faithful or perfect inside of yourself, which is inside of your body or your soul, or especially inside of your, uh, your flesh. That's the gross part of you. Okay. You can't be any of those things, but what you can be is inside of your spirit, inside of your spirit, when you're in the spirit. And by the way, Romans is talking about this over and over again. First John is talking about it. I mean, that so many of the epistles are getting into this. <clears throat> They'll say that when you're in your spirit, you're perfect. 
And it's so confusing for the church because what we have done is we spent all this time talking about works. If you do good works, God's going to do good things for you. If you do bad works, God's going to punish you. And we've got all this thing completely messed up because you can't accomplish perfection. You can't accomplish being faithful, but only the Holy Spirit inside of you can do that. And when you keep on taking up your dead flesh, it's ridiculous. And Paul talks about this over and over again in, in Romans 7, uh, 15 through 26. And he's just saying, listen, you can't do this. And thanks be to God that, that he accepts this wretched person inside of me. Now, here's this other part that we have to see. I guess I shouldn't put that lid on there, huh? Okay. The New Testament wants to be fulfilled. If we think about the Old Testament, it is setting up these basic ideas. But the New Testament wants to show the fulfillment of these ideas. That's the really important point. You see, God's not going to let any work be unfinished. And the works of the New Testament have to have the fulfillment. Part of the fulfillment comes inside of Jesus. Part of the fulfillment comes in through the Holy Spirit and the work in the church. But the other part of the fulfillment, the finalization, happens in that tribulation period of time that moves into the millennial reign. And then we have to have another set of fulfillment in eternity as we translate all the people out of that body point. Or not we, but Christ does, okay? Marriage is a momentous dream for most humans. It's a deep connection that you have. Now, if you have a happy marriage, I'm glad for you. If you have a sad marriage, it's difficult to live in. It's, it's a connection of, of two flesh. And it's supposed to say that, that those two flesh become one. It's, they're, they're glued together. And, and too many times over the last, specifically about 100 years, divorce is more and more common. And what it is, and we don't think about it, we think, well, I just didn't, I fell in love with you and I fell out of love with you and all this silly thing. What happens is that you have tough times and when you break it off, it hurts the kids, it hurts the people around, it hurts the two people. I mean, it's a mess with that. What's fascinating is that Jesus allows, through the uh, <coughs> God the Father says, I'm going to allow divorce in the Old Testament. He allows it for some crazy things. But here's what he says. I am not going to divorce. I don't allow divorce except for marital in infidelity. But he's saying, I'm never going to divorce you. Did you catch that point? Jesus in the New Testament, because he is faithful and he is perfect, is never going to divorce you. But we've talked about the goats who have divorced themselves from God. They have gone away from God. They haven't thought about God and what, he's, what he is inside of them. And so what they've done is said, you know what, Jesus, I don't care about you. I don't want to care about you. They've made their own choice, but if it's in the choice of the, the, the faithful, or excuse me, inside of the Spirit, or inside of Jesus, he's saying, oh, no, I'm not, I have no desire for that. Okay. So who are the participants? Let's go through this just a little bit. The ceremony entails the bride, and when we think about the bride, she is the church. And Ephesians 5 has this gorgeous, and you got to read through this. And Ephesians 5, you know, what, what Paul is talking about, he's saying, you know, the, the wife should do this to the husband, and the husband should do this to the wife. 
And I always talk about, you know, I mean, it talks about, you know, her honoring him and him loving her. And I always say this really powerfully because a lot of times over the years, we focus so much on what the woman's got to do to the man. And then he's, you know, we talk about the submission and it gets really ugly here. The reality is, is that she is choosing him. That's really, in, get down to the depth of it, she is choosing him. But can I just share with you, it doesn't happen if he doesn't do his part. This thing doesn't work if it's a one-sided event. Now I know men who have, have loved their wife selflessly and she hasn't returned it. And there are women who have honored <coughs> and submitted to their husband and he hasn't loved her and it doesn't work. And that's the problem that we miss inside of this. But what Paul says, okay, dude, I'm telling you this story. It's a good thing to think about, but what I'm really talking about is Christ as the groom and the church as the bride. I had a, I had a person that came into my one of my classes and Chris is really cool. You, you'd like her if you met her. And, and, she, and I asked her this question, I said, who are we in Christ? And she said, well, I, she's kind of catching me a little bit. I was, I was like, who are we? What, what does he call us? And she says, well, we're the child of God. And I said, does he say anything else? Yeah, the, the bride. And I'm like, Thank you. You said great information there. And I, she, and I said, but are we the child or are we the bride? And she goes, can't we be both? And I'm like, wait a second, a child doesn't get married. Not in, okay, in the right stuff, okay? But the child doesn't get married. What does the child do? The child goes from being a child. I acted as a child. And then I put away childish things. I drank the milk. I had the milk and then I ate the meat. What is that going from? That's going from childhood into adulthood, which is what the New Testament keeps pushing us on. The Old Testament keeps talking about these other ideas of divorce. He's saying, you know, I'm going to divorce you if you can't do some of those things. And there's a point of divorce. He puts them off with this. Now, God will always come back to the Jews and he comes back to the Jews as the remnant that will go into the millennial reign. I mean, he takes care of them. He's not missing them. Now, they always have a choice throughout the years up until the final remnant. But any person today can be a remnant of, that is Jewish in that way. But what we're talking about here is more on that bride issue. And who are the friends? Now, lots of people like to, to argue this one, but you're going to see this in Mark 10, 39, Luke 10, 23, John 3, 29. And I'm going to, I'm going to pitch out something to you. What those are actually saying is that the friend knows the master's work. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know the master's will. What's the master's will? It's to know that he's coming back, know what he's doing, know all of this process. Who tells us that process? Do you know who that is? That's the gospel writers. That's the Old Testament writers, those prophets, those are Old Testament saints or prophets. They told us about the nature of God. So Isaiah and Ezekiel, and then we come into the New Testament, Paul and James and Peter and on and on, okay? There's also a representation in Revelation 4 of the 24 elders, which I believe it's, it's, a, it's a representation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Those are the friends, they're watching. If you see this in the, in, the, in the New Testament, in Revelation 4, 
there's the sea of glass that is in front of the throne. And in that sea of glass, what happens? That's us, the bride. But then there's these 24 elders who are on the throne. They're watching this thing happen. They're not in it, they're around it. They're going to witness this. They have a different role. But what's so weird is the guests. And I want to, I want to walk through the guest a little bit. So we're going to back up and we're going to hit into a piece, piece of scripture that no one understands. I've seen this spoken so many times and they've misunderstood it so many times when you don't understand the groups. So we're in Matthew 22. 1 through 13. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables. Okay, remember, when you get into a parable, you're talking about what Christ is saying. He's, he's giving you um, a, a, an analogy, okay? So, it's important to him. The kingdom of heaven will be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He just set that whole sucker up, didn't he? See, some people want to say, well, we're not going to be in heaven. I mean, I've seen, I've seen there's teachers that talk about our dream isn't to be in heaven. Well, first off, that's ridiculous. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven, that means we're going to be in heaven. Okay? There's people who are in heaven. Maybe compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for the son. Let's just draw it out again. So we'll see it together. Okay, so I'll erase the board here a little so that you can see it together with me. So the kingdom of heaven has this king who has a banquet specifically the wedding banquet for his son. Now some of you will say, but what about this other banquet? It's called the feast or the banquet of the earth. And it's, it's, it's very unique with this. And it's, it comes out in the prodigal son that they're having a banquet. That banquet we talked about is, is for the sheep and the remnant. There's going to be a banquet for the people of the earth. Okay, this is a banquet that happens in heaven in the tribulation. We're the bride of Christ and we have to have a banquet. But the king, which would be, the king is the father or the dad. Did you catch that? He sent his slaves to summon those who, inv who were invited to the banquet and they didn't want to come. Oh my goodness, this is so cool when you see this. The word invited means kaleo. If you've kept up with this, this information with me, the kaleo are the called. Jesus is going to come back with his called, chosen, and faithful. The chosen are the Ecletos. The faithful are the Pistis. That means faith, okay? Now, he's saying that the invited are, coming to, are summoned to the banquet, but they didn't, didn't want to come. Why don't they want to come? Is it, is it that they're bad? It's that they, they wanted to prepare. They knew that, that he was coming back to the planet and they didn't prepare. These are the people that will live in the last half of the tribulation. And they will actually be a huge portion of the martyrs. And he doesn't speak badly. I mean, he's kind of frustrated with that. He's been calling them for generations, okay? But they didn't want to come. 
people are going to walk, we're going to walk into heaven. And when we have this, the called, chosen, and faithful, they don't want to come because they can't come until the end, or they don't come until the very end of the tribulation. We talked about that a few weeks ago. But they don't want to come. And again, he sent out the slaves, verse 4, telling those who are invited, look, I prepared a banquet. He uses the same word. I prepared a banquet. It's the same verse, same type of verse uh, words that happens in Luke 12, 47. Oh my gosh, guys. He's using the thing we called prepper. It's that same idea. It's that same endemic point. Look, I prepared a dinner. The ox and the fattened calf have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the banquet. He's calling them. This means, kaleo means to call someone. He's calling them forth. He's been calling them for a long time. But they paid no attention, went their own way to his own farm and to his business. They're focused on themselves. That's just, that's just what happens to the kaleo. They're very focused on themselves. They're very stubborn. They're, 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 they're preppers. They're, they're focused on what they can do. Then he had, in verse six, and he uses another verse. He says, these other slaves treated them outrageously and killed them. Who are they talking about? Those are the Old Testament saints and the, and, and the New Testament saints. And the, we go, like, what, what? He's enraged and sent troops to murder them and burn down their city. What are you talking about there? That's a, now he talks about a different group of people. That would be easily the wicked or the goats. More likely, I think, the goats. But he's, he's talking about a different set of people there. It's not the same because he keeps moving around here. Verse 8, then he told the slaves, the banquet is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Why aren't they worthy? Because they have not chosen for him. They didn't choose at the right time. Therefore, go to the exits, the roads of the exit of the city, and everyone you find to the banquet. So those slaves went out to the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. This messes with people. Are you good in who you are? No! We're all evil. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we don't catch who we are. We, inside of us, we are evil. It's just what it is. That's the chosen. The wedding banquet is filled with guests. Do you know the word guests comes from this basic idea to lean, to recline, to sit at the table together. When the guest came in view, he saw a man who was not dressed for the wedding. Now, if you remember my conversation I had with you about the goat and the sheep, the goats are the people who, and I've talked to you about before about this, he shows up naked to the wedding. Now, what happens to all the guests? The guests are these guys. How can these guys be the guests? Because we have to have a group of people that their destiny is to show up for this time frame. When I see theologians talk about this, talk about the wedding feast, they don't have any answer about this thing. They don't get it. And it is a powerful set of verses that talking about something that's happening in heaven. In heaven, there's a wedding banquet and there has to be people who are the bride, and we already know who the bride is. You got it. It's you. At least I hope that's you, right? The get, there are people who are guests and the people, no one ever answers this question. Who are the guests? If you don't know the different groups, you got to have guests. The, their whole goal, they didn't know. They did things deserving of blows and they will have some persecution because they will live through that first half of the tribulation not the second half. And so what they will do is they will, they will be at the guests. They will be a part of the guests. And those will be have the wedding robe of Christ. This is in Revelation 19, 7 and 8, where we put on the righteous robes 
of the saints or the works that they do. But the works isn't, people get too focused on the works part. The works can't happen until he has the propitiation that's, that you know, saves you out of that. And then he gives you grace to give you a robe. And then you get the works that will be on top of that. Okay, we just keep missing this if we don't understand it. Now Jesus in, in our, uh, and Jesus is telling the story. Okay, and he's talking about how the Father would do this, and that tells you how the Father and the Son are connected. So verse twelve, friend, how did you get in here without your wedding clothes? And the man was speechless, and he threw him out, time hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The dude that comes in and he comes in naked is the goat. Because goats go to the outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now again, this is an analogy. Are the goats up here in heaven? This is again a, a, an extended analogy. We know that the goats are happening right at that separation at the end of the tribulation, in that 45 days of the millennial reign. Now here's the powerful verse, and someone quoted me this just the other day. I was loving it that he said. He said, for, few, for many are invited, but few are chosen. And people misunderstand this verse. Now, are we, now we can see this on the surface, that you know, God invites a whole bunch of people to, to Christ, correct. And a few people are chosen. And see, some people want to use this as a predestination verse. It has nothing to do with predestination, guys. Nothing. We miss it if we're, miss, if we're using this as a predestination verse because we haven't put it in context. When many are invited, he just used the word kaleo. Many are kaleoed. But few are akletos. Huh. Did you catch that? Few are going to be part of the wedding guests. But a whole bunch of people were kaleoed. And that is how powerful those sets of verses are. And it makes so much sense when we understand this. Now, the invited don't want to come. They're the called. They're, they, come, they always hit on the Rosh Hashanah. The people, again, the people who are not dressed are the goats and the wedding feast, or the, the wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I want to throw something out at you. Revelation 14, 1 through about verse 12, has a unique set of verses. Now, remember, if we think about the 144,000, there's two places we understand them. From Revelation 1, or 7, 1 through verse 9. And then we come over here and they, they, they're, on he, they're in earth. In verse 9, they're somehow in heaven. I mean, it just moves right into heaven. This is where Hilton Sutton and, and, and now I you know, say this, this type of understanding of a rapture in the mid part. Okay? Now the 144,000 are the wedding singers. Now we go, what, 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 wedding singers? Let me just put it out to you. The, the 144,000 are young men who've never had sex with a woman. It's talking about that in Revelation 14, 1 through about 12. But then it says that they sing a song that no one can ever sing. I'm just throwing this out at you. Because there's always a wedding singer. I was the wedding singer. I was the guy that, that showed up to weddings. I'm just going to give you a little story. So um, I, was, I, I didn't have a big job this summer. And it was, uh, my, I think, of my junior to senior year. And I had to take a next senior year because I was student teaching. And it was like a double major with a minor and the whole thing. So I'm at home and I was painting my, my parents' house and barn. And so I was on the barn and I was still working on it. It's a really dirty job. And um, so I, I get a call of my mom screaming out for me, hey, someone's on the phone for you. So I, I call up and, and we lived in Parker, which is south of Denver by about 20 miles. And up in uh, way north Colorado, 
um, and I'm blanking the town out, so don't, don't ask me what that is. But the, a friend of mine who was up at Greeley, at UNC in Greeley, she was calling me up, she goes, and it's Tuesday. She's like, my wedding singer bailed on me. I'm like, oh man. She goes, yeah, I'm desperate. And she goes, I know you have sang in weddings. I've heard you sing, you know, would you come down and sing? I mean, or come up and sing. I'm like, what songs are you gonna sing? You can sing anything you want to. She's just so desperate for me to say yes. I'm like, just tell me what the songs are, okay? And she tells me the three songs. And two of the songs I'd actually performed before at weddings, and one, I knew the song pretty well, but I, I knew that there was gonna be a piano player, right? So on Friday, I, Thursday, Friday, something like that, I go over to this uh, Christian bookstore and I'm like, dude, here's the deal. It's a friend of mine. And he goes, I I'll let you borrow it for the weekend. Just bring it back in perfect condition. So I get to uh, tracks at the time. These are tape tracks. Now, this is a four and a half hour drive up to this northern Colorado town. And I'm, I'm shooting up there. Now, remember, a song is about four minutes long. So I got three songs that's 12 minutes long, and I played them over and over again. My voice was just hoarse because I'm trying to memorize them, okay? And so I drive up, and I, I come up on Friday, and I'm like, can I just do the songs in, in the service? And she's like, yeah, and I'm like playing it. And I right, sing it, and the piano player plays it. She's like, oh my gosh, you were like better than the guy that we had coming. Like go to their, their house. I, you know, I just spent a lot of time. It was just a fun time. One of the coolest weddings I'd ever done. And I never had a chance to write a song for them at that time frame. And I know that as that wedding singer kind of thing, you're always on the edge of the party. You just have a different role in that way. You're just that singer. And that's just what I was. That's just how many times I did that. So I just throw this out at you just as a kind of cool story with that too. Now what's the importance of the wedding, this last uh, slide here? The importance of the wedding, hold on, let me click that again. It's the desire for Jesus to have this complete intimacy with his creation. I mean, he's not doing this for the heck of it. He is doing this particular thing with his bride to have intimacy. For you men and women who are married to someone and it's a great situation. Sex is this deep, deep intimacy when you have that husband and wife and you're in that kind of role. And when you guys are in communion with one another it is a really powerful thing. And it is exactly the idea that happens with the bride in the wedding banquet. She has fulfilled that. Most brides are really stressed out before the wedding. And then after the wedding banquets happened and all the whatever happens, like they, they got the wrong color flowers or the wedding singer kind of cracked during a song or whatever the heck that happened, okay? Just think about the billion things that, that can go wrong. She's finally through it and she can't fix anything. So she finally just calms down for the most part. But what, what God is going to do, he's got people set up. He's got the angels to make this thing perfect. And you don't have to do anything at all. You're just going to come early to the wedding. I was joking about this. We had a two o'clock Saturday wedding and I asked my wife, I was like, when did you get there? And she goes, well, about an hour and a half early. I'm thinking, no, you didn't. You were getting ready before that. I mean, you walked in with your hair all perfect. She goes, well, maybe nine o'clock. When I say, I want you to think about this. See, people who believe that there's a mid or a post-trib rapture don't answer the part about weddings. They never answer the idea of the wedding. When does the bride ever show up late for the wedding? Think about that for a second. When does the bride ever show up late for the wedding? The answer is never, unless she's in a car accident or something like that. She never shows up. Now, sometimes the man doesn't show up or whatever, long story, but she always gets there early. That even happened in old time frames. He does this because he loves the bride. Not because she's perfect, but he makes her perfect inside of him. This is the completion of the work of the cross. Um, when he says, when Jesus says on the cross, 
it is finished and he gives up the ghost. I mean, that's in the, in the, uh, in the King James Version, it says it that way. When he says it is finished, he is completing everything. See, most people think that they're thinking too temporally. They think, well, I completed my life, I did it well, you know, finished the race, as Paul would say. Jesus isn't just saying that. Yeah, he's sort of saying that, but he's saying so much more. He's saying, I already fixed it. Now, if, if Jesus went, I they believe Jesus dies April 3rd, 33 AD. I've been, I was born in 1966. I become a believer in 1978. Just think about Scott for just a second. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be egocentric here, but just catch with me a minute. But Jesus was saying, I'm finished with Scott. Now we're in 2020. I've sinned and done things wrong and whatever, right? But he's even seeing me finished. He's looking at you. Think about the time you were born to when you became a believer to the end of your life. Or if you do die, um, or you are raptured hopefully down the road. The point is, is that you are finished. He already called you finished. And he doesn't even just go as far as that. He's going, he's thinking all the way into eternity. This is when Jesus finally gets that, that full point. He's, talk, he's now outside of the realm of, of, of time. And he is saying, it's all finished. Because Revelation 13, 8 says, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. That's what he's saying. So sex is that connection that we have, that, that part. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. That is that beginning. That's the shadow of that connection that you see. And we will have that come to fruition when Jesus takes his bride. Now I know I'm gonna say this to you and I've, it's taken me years. If you're a guy and you, know, you wanna be a studly guy kind of thing, you struggle with this idea of being a bride, like having the wedding gown and all, get over yourself, okay? I'm sorry, I have to, I've done this as well. You just gotta get past that idea. The reality is that you need him to love you because you're not lovable. You need him to accept you because you're not acceptable. All he's looking for you is to submit and to be underneath him in that way. And that's hard for a lot of people to do because they want to be in control. And guess what? You're not in control. We could count thousands of different ideas that come out of that you aren't in control. When a spouse says to you, I want to get divorced. When a business says, you're fired. When a business says, we don't have the work for you anymore. When you get a bill that is way outside of your ability to pay. When you have, I mean, when you've, when you've lost a son or a daughter or a, or a parent or a spouse, I mean, all those things are so far outside of your control. Three months ago, we're in March of 2020. Three months ago, I was on a bed in a hospital and they were telling my wife you might want to get your stuff in order because he's not coming back. And they were asking about a DNR, which is a do not resuscitate. He's had a severe stroke and he's going to die. We don't know why. And it was outside of my control, Wendy's control, Stefan's, my son's control. It was not outside of everyone's control. And yet, it was inside of his control. No. I'm not saying to you that everything is perfect and everything's gonna walk into perfection because we're in a fallen world, but he is in control. And only Jesus as this mystery explains it. So we're gonna do a couple more here. Subscribe, check us out. We're gonna do a next one series about the tribulation and the millennial reign temple. When you see the, the perfection of the temple and what it means as that shadow event, the Old Testament shadow point and the New Testament you know, revealing part, you'll see even more stuff about the, the blood of Jesus. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.